Now, I come to chapter 13, and we still are talking about the service of the sons of God. And we now are going to see that the believer has citizenship in heaven, but he also is in a world where he's a citizen down here. And we have a twofold responsibility. If there's a conflict, always our responsibility is to our Lord in heaven. But we are told, the Lord Jesus made it very clear. Remember, they brought to him a coin one day. And in fact, he asked for that coin. You know the reason he asked for a coin? Two reasons. He wanted to use what they had. And I don't think he had one in his pocket that day. He didn't have very much when he's down here in this world. Now, he said to them when he took that coin, whose image is here? They said, it's Caesar's. He said, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. Now, governments are ordained of God. He gave them certain authority. At the very beginning, God says, whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made him. God has given to governments the power to take human life when an individual takes another human life. Now, that is his regard for human life. Human life is precious in God's sight. You have no right to take another human life. If you do, you're to forfeit your own. Now, I know that I sound like a barbarian to a great many of these soft-hearted and soft-headed judges and lawyers today that are trying to get rid of capital punishment. And as we proceed to get rid of capital punishment, crimes are multiplying today. And the criminal is the hero, and the honest man today is the villain. Isaiah said days had come like that. They'll call evil good, and they'll call good evil. We live in days like that. You and I, though, have a responsibility to government. And therefore, we are told, in fact, Paul told a young preacher, he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, that's First Timothy 2, 1 to 3. I'd like to add this word, friends, that this doesn't mean that on Sunday morning the preacher's to pray that prayer that can become pretty monotonous Sunday after Sunday. I think that you are to pray that prayer yourself, not leave it to the preacher. Now, the duty of the believer as a citizen of heaven is spiritual, and the duty of a believer as a citizen under a government down here, it's secular. We need to keep those separate. These are two separate functions, and to combine them is to fail to keep church and state separate and distinct. Now, the Jew in Paul's day was reluctant to bow before the proud Roman state. Jewry had fomented disturbances in the city of Rome, and as a result, Claudius had banished them on one occasion. Now, the proud Pharisees rejected the Roman authorities in Palestine in their desire to restore the government to the nation Israel. It was they who masterminded the encounter with Jesus which raised the issue, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now, the implications smack of a revolution, as you can see. It's well to remember that the authorities in Paul's day were mad and murderous. And there was Nero on the throne. There was Herod and Pilate and all that bunch of rascals. And yet, he said, we are to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Now listen to Paul. And he says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, you and I are to obey the laws of the land. A Christian should be a law-abiding citizen. Now, you can't make me believe that you can carry on the violence and lawlessness of this present hour and still be a Jesus boy or girl. You are a Jesus freak if you take that position, and I mean a freak, my friend. 
because we are to be law-abiding folk, even when we think the law is unjust. Now, that's difficult for us to see, of course. We're to submit ourselves to the authorities for the very simple reason that they are ordained of God. Now, it's true that the kingdoms of this world belong to Satan, and injustice and corruption abound in all governments, and it is in our government today. Yet, in spite of all of that, God has control. History, I think, is the monotonous account of how a government flourished for a time in pomp and pride and then was brought to ruin and rubble. Why? Because that government went into lawlessness and that government went into corruption. And as it did, why, God brought it to an end. In other words, God still rules even over this world. I think that Emerson was wrong. He said, things are in the saddle and they ride mankind. Now, it looks that way. But God is not abdicated. And God is riding triumphantly in his own chariot, as we've seen today. And he's not disturbed about what's happening in this earth. He's not biting his fingernails today, wondering about little man and the governments he has down here. You'll recall that at the death of Uzziah, when the government seemed to be disintegrating, Uzziah had been a good king. And Isaiah, at that time, and he was discouraged. He was not unlike the ilk of mankind. He was very much discouraged. He thought things were going to the bow wows. And he went into the temple, though, and that's a good place for a man to go, and especially in days like this, to come into God's presence. And he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. In other words, God had not abdicated. Isaiah was dead, but God wasn't. God was still on their throne. Now, the allegiance of the Christian is to that throne, and his relationship to his government on earth is submission. That is it. And you can't escape it. I'm reading now verse 2 in my translation. So that anyone resisting the authority withstanding the ordinance of God, and those withstanding shall receive for themselves judgment. Now, the principle stated in verse 1 raises many questions, which the following verses amplify and explain, therefore. So here, the verse here seems to preclude the possibility of a believer having any part in a rebellion or revolution. What about it? Well, it's the example of Cromwell and Washington. Both of those men led a revolution, friends. But Stifle offers no solution. I'm not sure I'll have one, but I'm going to do the best I can. The believer has opposed bad government and supported good government on the theory that good government is the one ordained to God. The believer is for law and order as over against lawlessness. He's for honesty and justice as over against corruption and rank injustice. At great moments and crisis in history, and that's where we are today, the believer has some difficult decisions to make. And I want to just give you my viewpoint, and I believe that it will coincide with history. Now, in these last days, lawlessness abounds. The believer must be opposed to it, not be a part of it. Even when it's in his own government, we need to beware of those who would change our government under the guise of improving it. You remember John the Baptist, he was beheaded by Herod. Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. James, the brother of John, was slain with the sword of Herod. And Paul was put to death by Nero. And yet Paul says here, Whoso therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Therefore, Christianity never became a movement to improve government or help society or clean up the town. The gospel was the power of God and the salvation of the individual. And Paul never went around telling about the bad condition of Roman jails. And he knew all about them from the inside because... About every town he went to, 
He ended up in the jail, and he knew a great deal about Roman jails, Roman prison. I was in that Mamertine prison in Rome not long ago, and I got claustrophobia down. I said to my wife, let's get out of here. Paul couldn't get out of there. They kept him down the dam. You remember he said to Timothy, he says, bring the cloak with you. <laughs> He's getting cold down there. May I say to you, friends, that it's very difficult to say today that we're to obey a corrupt government. And I want to make this statement right now. I am not impressed today by these men who are running up the American flag and singing the national anthem and doing all of that just as a matter of promotion for themselves, whether it be a preacher or a politician. And yet, back of that is corruption. And there is corruption today in government. And I'll be very frank with you. I'm very resentful today, and I'm cynical of government. I have to be. Because when I hear of certain government officials and certain wealthy men in positions of power that didn't pay any taxes at all, and I'm retired now, and I got caught in a year when I retired, and I had to pay the taxes, and I never had a pension, and I had nothing to fall back on, and I actually, for three months after I paid my taxes, I had to scrounge around to get by. Now, that doesn't make me happy when I find out men in high places have managed not to pay taxes. I say to you, there's corruption today in government, all the way from the top to the bottom, and it's not confined to just one party. And these unsaved, these godless men that are in positions of government today, they do not understand, actually, the American system. You see, we were made a nation of laws by men who had a Bible background. Now, I don't think Thomas Jefferson was a Christian. He was a deist. But he had great respect for the Word of God. And many of those men were outstanding Christians. John Hancock was. He's the first name on the Declaration of Independence. He signed it. My friend, may I say to you that today we have corruption in government. And again, may I say to you that there's something radically wrong. I go into the civic centers of our cities today, and I see these fine buildings that cost millions of dollars given out to contractors that are the friends of the politicians to build. And then I see these poverty sections today, and I hear both parties talking about a poverty program, and nothing's been done. Oh, corruption is there. What's wrong? Well, the thing's wrong is in the hearts of men. Now, what are we to do? Well, my business is to give out the Word of God, and my business is to obey the law. And I feel like that that's what Paul is saying here. Listen to him. For Christianity is not a movement. I want to repeat it. To improve government or to help society clean up the town. It is to preach a gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. And it will bring into existence individuals like the man who signed the Declaration of Independence and gave us a government of laws. What's wrong today? Nothing wrong with our form of government. There's something wrong with the individuals that are in positions of power. One man had a history department, University of Michigan, made the statement that America's in the hands of those who do not understand, actually, the spiritual heritage that we have. I'm reading now verses 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he's the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he's the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, my point is this, that a government is to maintain law and order. 
And when it doesn't do that, it has failed. And I think the Christian is to be opposed to that. He says here, the rulers, we're to respect them when they are enforcing the law. And I'll be very honest with you. I have great respect today for our army. And yet I know it's honeycomb with corruption. I have great respect today for policemen. And yet I know they make mistakes. But I don't think they make near the mistakes that they get blamed for today. The thing is, I even have respect for the traffic cop that stops me and says, say, did you know you were going past the speed limit? And I can't blame him for that. I blame this boy for his stupidity and not watching that rearview mirror a little more careful than I did. It was my mistake. But actually, the child of God is to obey law. Listen to verse 5. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Not only because you'll be judged and have to pay the fine, but for conscience sake. And every Christian, I'll be honest with you, I never hear a siren. But what I don't look in the rearview mirror and slow down. And I think that's a Christian conscience that says you do that, my friend. Now, verse 6, For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. And I resent today the way taxes are being used. The problem is not with the form of government. The problem is with man. Man is the X in the equation of government. And that X is an uncertain entity, let me say. Now, he says, for this cause pay ye tribute, or for on account of this ye pay taxes also, for they're God's ministers attending continually upon this very matter. And he's called a minister here, and that's the same word for a minister in religion. It's the same word that we have in liturgy. And this means that the ruler occupies a divinely appointed office. He has no religious function whatsoever, nor is he a religious person. But he is a God-appointed office. That makes me pay my taxes, but I resent it. And I'm cynical about today in this land of ours. We need a heaven-sent revival. And I'm tired of liberalism today. I'm sick and tired of these that are shedding crocodile tears. You remember the walrus and the carpenter. And Carol was writing a book of brilliant satire. Remember the walrus and the carpenter? That's liberal religion and politicians. They were walking along the seashore and they were weeping. (laughs) You know who they were weeping for? Because there was so much sand. (laughs) But they just kept eating the oysters. And I say to you, what a picture that is of corruption. But listen, this is the position of the child of God. Verse 7, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And I believe I should respect my policemen. I don't think any of them are pigs. (laughs) I think there are a lot of pigs calling them pigs, but I don't think they are. And I think I should respect him, and I respect the man in uniform, and I do not think that any cartoon should be made of the president of the United States or a governor of the state. There may be unworthy men in the office, but we're to respect the office. They used to tell me in the Army, you salute the uniform. But I want to tell you, there's some folk in that uniform. I didn't care about saluting, but you saluted the uniform. We should have respect today. And that is the position of the Christian in this world today. A Christian will make the best citizen, though his citizenship is in heaven. Now, we have a relationship to our neighbor. This is here in verses 8 through verse 14. And this will take us through the chapter. He says, Now, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another fulfill the law. Did you borrow the lawnmower, your neighbor? Take it home. Housewife, did you borrow a cup of sugar from your neighbor? Then return it, please. Oh, no one anything, not even one person, except loving one another. Now, that's what you owe them. In this, we find Paul saying that 
the believers positively to owe no man anything. Now, this is a great principle to guide Christians in installment purchasing, by the way. Somebody says, you don't think you ought to buy on credit? Turn in your credit cards? No. Better see your way clear that you're going to be able to pay your debts. And he does add that the believer always owes the debt of love to his neighbor. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily the man next door. You remember, he's already said you'd live peaceably as much as you can. But certainly, this matter of love is a practical thing that he's talking about here. Now, this is not some sentimental thing. And I get just a little disturbed myself today when I hear liberalism continually talk about love, and it's got man talking about it. Love, love, love. Well, how do you reveal love? Well, thou shalt not commit adultery. (laughs) And today there is this committing of adultery, the sin of sex is about us. Now, don't tell me you love and that you're committing adultery. You don't. You can call that love if you want to. But it's nothing in the world but sex. And it is nothing in the world but licentiousness. It's fornication. And it's sin in God's sight. He hasn't changed. And love reveals itself. Thou shalt not kill. You can kill a person more ways than pulling the trigger on a gun. You can ruin their reputation. Therefore, thou shalt not steal. You won't get anything dishonest. And thou shalt not covet. And that is something today. When that neighbor drives up in the new automobile, how do you feel about it? Sometimes we say, I wish I had that car and they had one just like it. What you really mean is you would like to have it and wish they didn't. Or you'd much rather for you to have it than for them to have it. Now, love manifests itself in these areas. He's not putting the Christian back under law. He's just saying, now, you talk about love all you want to, Mr. Liberal, but are you making your church a place to get the pills and to get drugs? Then you don't love anybody. You're just a hypocrite. That's all you are. Because love manifests itself, not committing adultery, not killing, not stealing, not bearing false witness, not coveting. Don't tell me that you do these things and you still love. You don't. What you're talking about is sex, and that's not what Paul's talking about. Now he says, verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. That's the negative side of it. You're not going to harm anyone. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, Verses 11 and 12, and that knowing the time, that now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the arm of light. Now, Paul said that 1,900 years ago. We ought to say it with a little more urgency in this day in which we're living today. Let me give you my translation. And this, seeing that ye know the time or the season, that now it is the hour for you to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is passing, far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now this closing section, it's an alarm clock that goes off at this particular time to waken believers who've gone to sleep in the world and forgotten this added incentive for yielding our total personalities to God. My friend, this is no hour, no time for a child of God to live for this world or the things of this world. I think many a businessman today, many a rich Christian, is going to be embarrassed if the Lord comes. How big will your bank account be, my friend? Are you using yourself and that which you possess for God today? How much is he really getting of you? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you yield your total personalities, all you are, all you have, to God. This is rational. This is reasonable. This is what you ought to be doing, Christian friend. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, and it'll mean you're going to live for God.
this idea that preachers can get divorces and live like the world and then talk about the fact they're premillennial and that they are pre-trib and they're looking for the imminent coming of Christ. My friend, let me be as strong as John the Apostle was. You're a liar. John said, a man is a liar that does that and his lie does not correspond. Let us wake up today, friend. Let us live for God in this hour in which we live. Listen to him. Verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or revelings and drunkenness, not in sexual intercourse and dissolute abandon, not in strife and jealousy. This is what the Word of God says to you today in this day when we talk about the new morality, which is the old life before the flood. And then he says in verse 14, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the desires thereof. Oh, how many Christians today making every provision for the flesh, but making no provision to go into his presence someday. Let's get the word of God out. Let's begin to put him first in our lives. My friend, this is all important. This is very important. Now we're going to see another practical issue, and it's controversial also, in chapter 14 and 15, the separation of the sons of God. What do you mean by separation? And I'm so tired of separated and dedicated Christians that are not separated, not really dedicated. Oh, they make me sick, and I'm sure they do you. Now, there are two areas of Christian conduct. One area, the Bible's very clear on. We saw that last time. He took the commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And my friend, the new morality is not for the Christian. If you think it is, then may I say to you that there's no use us discussing it. Anyone that says that they can be a Christian and commit adultery and steal and lie and do that sort of thing, I just want to look you right straight in the eye and say to you, you're not a Christian. That is according to what Paul said. Paul says that this is the thing that is clear. The Word of God is clear on these things that have to do with certain matters of conduct. But there are other areas of conduct that the Bible actually doesn't have a clear word on it. For instance, what about using makeup? Should a Christian woman use makeup? The Bible's not clear on it, friends. Those are questionable things. What about smoking? Is that something a Christian can or cannot do? How do you judge your conduct relative to those things? What about mixed bathing? What about these matters? Now, if you do not believe this is questionable, let me be very frank with you today. I mentioned smoking and mixed bathing. Now, my wife was raised in Texas in a, may I be very frank, a Southern Baptist church. She was brought up by a mother and father and by a church and a pastor that believed that mixed bathing was sinful, wrong. And when she came to California, you can't imagine the shock that she had the first time that we went down to the beach with our young people. Believe me, friends, even in those days, they weren't wearing too much. My wife was in a state of shock for 24 hours after that. She'd never seen anything like that. But you know, there was another area that where she came from, why the officers of the church smoked like the pastor did. (laughs) And when she got out here and found out that that's taboo, well, you just can't be a Christian and smoke. So what is it? Is mixed bathing all right in one place, wrong in another? And is smoking all right in one place and wrong in another? How are you going to judge your conduct today, friend? Now, we're talking about the area of questionable things. And already I know that the hair on the back of the neck of some of the saints is standing on end. And they said, Dr. McGee, you ought to give a nice little lecture against smoking, and you let this subject of mixed bathing alone, because my son and my daughter go down to the beach, and they 
go with other young people, and that's all right. Now, may I say, I'm not condemning either one, and I want you to know something else, and I'm not condoning either one either. I'm not going to stick my neck out on questionable things any farther than Paul stuck his out. Therefore, he puts down now the principles of conduct for Christians relative to questionable matters. And he's going to put down three guidelines, and these guidelines are very important. A Christian in his conduct, as we shall see, and I'll not turn to the Scripture now, we'll come to it, must have a conviction about anything that he does. A Christian should not do anything unless he has a conviction on it. Then the second thing that should guide him is a conscience. That is, a conviction means that which he anticipates. Does he look forward to what he's going to do? in high anticipation and glee and enthusiasm? And then does he look back on it, having done it, and hates himself for having done that? Or he wonders whether he was right or wrong. That is the second guideline. And the third is a consideration for others. A Christian in his conduct should always have a consideration of others. Now, we're going to see how all of this ties together, and that these three become guidelines for believers. Now, I'm told that when you come in to Seattle, this was true years ago, that there were three points. Now, I do not know what all of them were. I've heard about them, but I'm not going to attempt to call them out now because this program goes to Seattle, and I'll be corrected, I'm confident. So I won't call them out because I actually do not recall all of them. I think I have two of them, but I won't mention those. But there are three points that when a ship was coming into the harbor years ago, when those three were brought into line, then the ship knew it was coming in accurately. Now, that's exactly what Paul is doing up here. He's putting up three lights. And when you are sailing over the sea of life, the idea is to have these three principles before you all the time. Now, there are, I think, two extreme viewpoints in this matter of Christian conduct about questionable matters, and it has created an artificial atmosphere in which one is to live the Christian life, so that actually we have, I think, abnormal, subnormal Christians in these extreme areas. Now, one position has no wall of separation from the world. And these folk, their lives are a carbon copy of the man in the world and their own lives prior to their so-called conversion. They indulge in all forms of worldly amusement. They go everywhere the world goes, and they spend their time and energy in the things that profit not. Now, I think certain passages of Scripture have no meaning for them at all. Let me turn to just one epistle on this. Philippians 3, 17, listen to this. Brethren, be followers together of me. Mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mine earthly things. Now, there are some folk today that won't go to a movie. They don't dance, and they don't do many things like that. But they are as worldly as anyone possibly could be. They gorge and gormandize themselves. They never get drunk, but they certainly overeat. And they overtalk. They are great gossips. And they move in that area. They live like the world. They even tell questionable stories, by the way. Now, again, Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, there be any praise, think on these things. And what do you think about? Your thought life is bound to affect your conduct sooner or later. No man ever committed a murder that didn't plan it ahead of time. 
That's premeditated. And that's what real murder is. It's manslaughter. It's done accidentally. Murder is planned. It's premeditated. And I found out that a great many Christians, they turn things over in their mind a long time before they do the thing. Now, this sort of thing is done by a great many so-called Christians today. Paul seemed to question whether they were Christians or not, because they live just like the world lives. Uh, Christians should be separated. But wait, there's another extreme. That's at the other end. Now, this other group, they've become extreme in the opposite direction. They've reduced the Christian life to a series of negatives. Paul said in Colossians 2.21, touch not, taste not, handle not. And that's the group. Paul warns against them. I'm always afraid of the man that is too separated, that they touch not, taste not, handle not. Now, these folk rejoice in salvation by grace and deliverance from the law, but they immediately set up and make a new set of Ten Commandments, only they don't stop with ten, they double the number. And they become very self-centered, very critical, and very proud. These are the ones that Paul labels weak in the faith, by the way. And they are the ones that become very separated. I'd like to read you a letter from a lady who was saved in our Thursday night Bible study years ago, probably 20 years ago. That's when we met on Wednesday night. And she went back east, and she wrote me this letter after she returned. She says, I've returned to California after a year of full-time Christian service in Ohio and an extended trip east. But I've come back almost spiritually shipwrecked. I've been a Christian now for three and a half years and until recently was able to give a glowing testimony about being saved out of unity. But lately I've been so dead that Christ seems way up there and I'm way down here. I have all the negative virtues of a Christian. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't play cards, don't attend movies, don't use makeup. But those things do not make a happy Christian. My friends tell me I'm becoming bitter, and oh, I don't want that to happen. Before becoming a Christian, I was very ambitious, worked hard for whatever I believed in, and incidentally, I was listed in who's who. But now I wonder, what's the use? The world is going from bad to worse. Everything is heading for disaster, and the only hope is to wait for the return of our Lord Jesus. Now, my friend, may I say, this party was in a terrible condition. But notice how separated. This kind of separation won't bring joy in your life at all. And now, somewhere between these two extremes, the believer is to walk and to live and move and have his being. This is the Scylla and Charybdis that we're to steer our little bark through the sea of life today. And I put down this preliminary because this is an important section today, and I know right now that I'm speaking to a great many puzzled Christians why I've done all these things and why I'm not a happy, joyful Christian. I think Paul will answer this for you if you let him. Now notice, first we have here the relationship to weak believers, and that is what he's talking about here, and it's in this section he'll put down these three great principles. And I'll call attention to them when we get to them, because he sums them up in three verses. Now, verse 1, we begin there. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Now, actually, it's the one who is weak in faith. Receive him into your fellowship, but not with the view of passing judgment upon his scruples, that is, upon his conduct upon his viewpoint. And this now connects us with what's gone before. In other words, Paul had said that all of these things, that you will not commit adultery and all that sort of thing, not bear false witness, not covet, that the law of love will cover all of that. But now he says the law of love is to go into action. So in condemning things which are immoral and obviously wrong, 
Back in chapter 13, he warns against the danger of condemning questionable matters which are not expressly forbidden in Scripture. And Paul speaking almost ex cathedra. Now, will you notice? He says the one who is weak, it's in faith. It doesn't mean he's weak in the truths of the gospel, the facts of faith. But rather, it refers to this abstract quality of faith. It means the faith of the weak falters and hesitates about matters of conduct. He doesn't know what he should do relative to certain things. This one is to be received into the fellowship of the believers with open arms. You may not agree with him, but you're to receive him if he's a believer in Christ. You're not to receive him in order to raise an argument with him or with them about their extreme separation. Now, one group of believers is not to sit in judgment upon another group of believers about questionable matters of Christian conduct. Some things are not expressly condemned in the Scripture. And some believers separate themselves from these things. And by the way, if they want to, that's their business. And maybe they should do it. But these things ought not to separate believers. And the church has no authority to decide questions of personal liberty in things not expressly forbidden in Scripture. That is a note in the Schofield Reference Bible and one that should be called our attention today. Now, verse 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Now, this is interesting. And this is the thing that may hurt the extreme separationists. The strong brother in the faith is the one eating all things. The weak brother is the vegetarian. The strong brother realizes that Jesus made all meats clean, cleansing all meats. After the flood, God gave all meats to be eaten. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Genesis 9, 3. But God made a distinction between clean and unclean animals for the nation Israel. And the instructed believer knows this does not apply to him. For the apostle says, But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. You remember, Peter was given that practical lesson on the housetop of Simon the Tanner and Joppa. This man, Simon Peter, says, I haven't eaten anything unclean. Boy, was he separated. And he was proud of the fact, I've never eaten anything unclean. The Holy Spirit said to him, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now, Paul could eat meat with no compunction of conscience whatsoever. But this man, Simon Peter, he had scruples about it. Now, what about it? Well, may I say to you that one can eat, the other cannot. And by the grace of God, one's not to eat, one's to eat. What's the principle? We'll come to it. Verse 3 now. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Now, I recognize I'm wrong when I condemn these extreme separationists. They want to be that way. Candidly, that's their business. The thing, though, that bugs me is they want to straighten me out. And I know I need straightening out, but they're not the crowd to do it. I'm sure of that. May I say to you that one group is not to condemn another. And he uses, now, meat, this could apply to anything. If you believe that you shouldn't eat meat, and let me keep it in that area, then you shouldn't eat meat, friend. But if you believe that you can eat meat, then you eat the meat. That's the principle that he'll come to. Now we come here to verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth a falleth. Yea, he hath holden up, for God's able to make him stand. And friends, this is devastating. Paul says here, what right have you to judge another man's servant? What right have you, Christian friend, to sit in judgment on another Christian's conduct about something that's questionable? What right have you? Are you God? Is that person accountable to you? Paul says, he's not accountable to you. He's accountable to God. He's going to stand before his own master. Can you imagine going out to dinner? And the servant in the kitchen who's serving brings in cold biscuits. 
And you say to the servant, what's the big idea of bringing me cold biscuits? And you dress down and ball out, we say, the common colloquialism. You ball out the servant, the cook. May I say to you, it'd be an awkward silence in that home. That person is not your servant. <laughs> Maybe she shouldn't have served cold biscuits. That's none of your business. I have a notion that the lady of the house will go back in the kitchen and she'll attend to that matter. And by the way, Christian friend, maybe you don't like the way I part my hair, but I don't have to account to you. I'm responsible to God for my life. I'm responsible to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my master, and you're not my master. Now he comes to the first great principle. Verse 5, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Be convinced, be assured. Now, Paul changes the illustration from diet to this day question. Now, some insist that the Lord's day is different and that you ought to observe Sunday. Some say that you ought to observe Saturday. May I say, it's not the day that should be different. It's the believer that should be different, my friend. And it's not the day that you observe. Let no man, Paul says, therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days. Don't you tell me what day I'm to observe. I am not responsible to you. I'm responsible to the Lord Jesus. He's my master. But whatever you do for God, you ought to do it with enthusiasm. I think it's sinful the way some people go to church on Sunday. No enthusiasm. Can you imagine people going to a football game when their alma mater's playing with the enthusiasm that they go to a church service? That's one of the reasons people don't go to church today is because it's the attitude of the believers. And my friend, the Lord says, don't you do anything for me unless you have a conviction about it, unless you believe in it and want to do it. And if it's questionable... My friend, I don't care what it is. If it's to teach a Sunday school class and you've got some question about it, you better give it up because that's wrong for a Christian to do things that are questionable for him. Now, the other brother may be able to do it. You know, we have several words in the English language that you need to understand the preposition that goes with them to really understand the word. You take the word cleave. A thing can be cleaved apart or it can be cleaved together, and actually means the opposite, same word. Now, separation is from, but separation is also unto. When a fellow gets married, he's now separated unto one girl, and he better be, because that's what marriage is. And the separation from is not the important thing. It's separation unto. And if he's really separated unto one, he'll be separated from, all right. So that the problem today in Christian conduct and in separation is to understand that we're separated unto Christ. Paul was separated unto the gospel, separated unto Christ. And that's actually what holy means today. What is a holy vessel? They had pots and pans in the tabernacle. And on that wilderness journey, they got beaten up. They didn't look very good. And you'd say, you mean to tell me those instruments are holy? Yes. They were used exclusively for God. And that ought to be the position of every Christian. Now, that's what it means to be separated. Separated unto Christ. Remember, Paul says, I've espoused you. And he's talking to those carnal Corinthians. I've separated you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. And the whole point is to be separated unto him. If you love him, <laughs> you love his word, you want to be with him, want to talk with him, then separation is no problem. The problem is these super-duper, hyper-separated saints today that worry me to death because they say, oh my, you don't do that, do you? Sure, I do that. And what they're talking about is actually playing golf. Now, I think they're meddling when they begin to get in that area. Now, 
I personally think whatever a Christian does, he ought to do with enthusiasm, and that is this first great principle Paul puts down here in verse 5. Notice this, and I'm going to give you my translation today. On the one hand, one regardeth one day to be above another. On the other hand, another regardeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And when I was a student in seminary, why, I was brought up in a denomination in the South that were strict, actually Sabbatarians, but Sunday was their Sabbath day, they called it. And they just didn't believe in traveling on Sunday. I used to take the train and go down to Augusta, Georgia to preach. And I'd take the train Saturday evening. And do you know that some of the officers of that church wanted to know what time the train got in to Augusta, Georgia? I never was clear on that because of the fact that I got on the train. I said, I got on it Saturday evening. And the splitting hairs like that. One man said to me one day, said, doesn't that disturb you? I said, doesn't disturb me at all. One man observes a day. I respect that man. I don't think he ought to travel on Sunday. I see no reason when I'm going from one engagement to another and it's necessary to travel on Sunday. Why, to do that, may I say to you, whatever you do, he says here, let every man be fully persuaded, be convinced in his own mind, be assured in his own mind. In other words, what you should do, you should do with enthusiasm. Why, a man can go out here in Los Angeles to the stadium, Coliseum, and see a football game and yell his head off, so that he can't even open his mouth the next day. He's yelled like a fanatic or Comanche Indian. And he can go to a Dodger game at night and do the same thing. And they say, my, he's a fan. But if you just stand up and give one little squeak for Jesus Christ, you're called a fanatic. Now, whatever a Christian does, he ought to do it with enthusiasm. And that's the reason today that going to church... It's not attractive to the world. Have you ever seen the saints on the way to church on Sunday morning? They're not doing it with enthusiasm. Whatever you do for Christ should be done with enthusiasm, done with excitement. Be convinced of this. This is the thing. I watch these people going to a Dodgers baseball game. I want to be very frank with you. I've never been inside that stadium, and I don't get any wrong ideas. To me, that's a waste of time. But I don't condemn anybody else that goes there. I just don't think that they're thinking right, but that's their business. And if they want to go, fine. I don't. And whatever I do, I want to do it with enthusiasm. Now, somebody says, yes, but you go to golf course. When I go to golf course, I go with enthusiasm. I go because I want to go. And whatever I do for the Lord, I make these tapes because I want to. I'd rather do this than anything that I know of. If you want to know, I came down here this morning at 6.30 to make this tape because of the fact that this is something I love to do. And I want to see a Christian teach a Sunday school class except a work. And one of the reasons church work is bogged down as it is today Why they say to this individual, will you teach this Sunday school class? Oh, if you can't get anybody else, I'll take it. Don't take it, brother. If that's the way, well, they won't have a teacher, and they won't have a teacher. Because I think that some people are actually committing sin doing church work. Because what we should do, and this is the first great principle, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now let's bring that over to questionable things today. What about this thing and another? Now, I had a little delegation of girls several years ago. I think they probably passed this period now. But they came to me and they said, Do you think it's wrong for a Christian to dance? I think I surprised them a great deal. I said, Well, for you, I think it's wrong. But for me, it'd be all right. They gasped. They said, what do you mean by that? Well, I said, 
I have no question about it. If I wanted to dance, I'd do it with enthusiasm. I don't do it. But the point is, you've got a question. <laughs> and whatever you do, you be persuaded in your own mind. And you wouldn't have come and asked me the question if you had been persuaded in your own mind. I said, I've never had anybody come and ask me whether they ought to go to a football game or not, or go to a baseball game. They go, and they go with enthusiasm. Now, may I say to you, Christian friend today, and I'm not telling you what to do, but I am saying it's a great principle. If you've got a question in your mind about something you're doing, I don't care what it is, for you it's wrong. might not be wrong for me, but it's sure wrong for you. Simon Peter followed the Lord afar off. He went that night into the judgment hall of the high priest. I sat in a hotel in Jerusalem, in the old city, on the side of the Valley of Kidron. And when the morning sun had come up from the east, it had just make that whole city ablaze across the Kidron Valley. And one of the places that's outside the city wall, don't many see it, is the Church of the Cock Crowing. That's on the spot where the high priest's judgment hall was. That's where Caiaphas's home was. And that's where Simon Peter came in. It's called the Church of the Cock Crowing. And Simon Peter, I'm convinced, shouldn't have gone there that night. But John, who apparently had a home in Jerusalem, knew apparently everybody. He went in there that night. He didn't deny the Lord. <laughs> Simon Peter did. It was all right for John. It was wrong for Simon Peter. May I say to you, you better have a conviction about you. John had no qualms at all about that. But for this weak brother, Simon Peter shouldn't have gone in there. Now, it's the weak brother today who is the separated brother. That may seem strange to you. But these people today that have set up a little system, and that get up and they say, I don't do this, and I don't do the other thing. I was in school with a fellow that we used to have a water fight on Saturday night in the seminary dorm. And this dear brother, he would get together two or three of the super-duper saints, and he'd pray for us. I've always hoped he'd pray that I'd win it, but oh, we were terrible. Well, we were pretty rough fellas, and I think we did do a lot of damage to property. There was one night we soaked all the rugs, and we almost got booted out of the place. But this young fella, oh, how super-duper he was. Did you know that about 15 years after that, I sat down with him and his wife, begged him not to leave his wife, and he told me he had to. And I said, why? He says, because I have a little daughter by a woman out in Australia, and I want to marry her. And I say to you, he was the super-duper saint. May I say the weak brother is the brother that's totally separated. When you meet one of those, you better keep your eye on him, because he's the weak one. The child of God today does what he does with enthusiasm for God. And they are the ones, I think, get the job done today. Now, I've spent a little time there, and I've done that purposely, friend, because this is important. That means, therefore, that questionable amusements are wrong for the believer if they're questionable to him. But if he can do that and still maintain his relationship with Christ. Now, let me tell you a little story in connection with that. Many years ago in Tennessee, a young lady went to her pastor and said, Do you think it's wrong? for a Christian to dance. And he said, anywhere you can take Jesus Christ with you is all right to go. Well, that made her angry. She said, well, I can take him to the dance. The pastor said, then go ahead. And so she went to the dance. And that night she said, anywhere I can take Jesus Christ. So a boy cut in on her, danced with her. She hadn't met him before. And she said to him, are you a Christian? He said, no. He wanted to make conversation. He said there, are you a Christian? She said, yes. And this is what the unbeliever said. What are you doing here? <laughs> That's what the unbeliever said. She went home. She decided maybe she couldn't take Jesus Christ. Uh, anywhere you take him, friends, 
it's all right to go. I don't care where that is. If you can take him into the bar room, you go there. The only trouble of it is the other fellows in the bar room will wonder what you're doing there. And that will be another principle later on. Now let me move on down. Verse 6. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So that if you can go out on Sunday, and maybe you play golf on Sunday, and you can take Jesus Christ with you, stop out maybe on the ninth hole and have a prayer with the foursome you're playing with, then may I say to you that it'd be great. But I want to say this to you. What will the foursome back of you think of you when they are held up and say, those fellas are praying? And you know what one of them is going to say? What in the world are they doing out here today? Now, let's move on. The one thing is that the one with meat, he gives thanks to God from his heart. The one without meat, he gives thanks to God from his heart. It's not what's on the table, but what's in the heart that makes the real difference in man. That's the important thing. And that's what conditions Christian conduct. Now, verses 7 and 9. For none of us liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Now, the important thing to note here is a great many people say, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. And they use that as teaching the fact that our lives affect others and it's our influence. But that's not the thought here. The fact that is here is that we cannot live our lives apart from Christ. As a Christian, you can't live your life. Whether you live, you'll have to live to him. Whether you die, you're going to have to die to him. Now, our conduct, therefore, is not limited or gauged by the food spread on the table by the fact that our lives are spread out before him. That's the thing that's important. And you're going to have to give an account for the things done in the flesh. So what you do, where you go, remember, one of these days, you'll sit down with him. And it's not going to be a question of meat on the table. But it's going to be the question of your relationship to him when you sat down at that table. And you can be godless without meat, and you can be godless with meat, of course. That's the thing that is important here. And now Paul comes to this, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it's written as I live, saith the Lord. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, I've never quite understood why people want to go to Bethlehem at Christmas time. There's no star there. But the Bible closes with the Lord Jesus saying, I am the offspring of David, the root and offspring of David, and I'm the bright and morning star. Now, that's the star that we're moving toward today. That's the star we should be following. For one of these days we'll be in his presence. Therefore, he says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. The problem is, you remember the Lord Jesus said to that bunch of Pharisees who wanted to stone a prostitute. He said to one that's without sin, here's a brick, throw it at her. (laughs) Not one of those boys were throwing bricks that day. And my friend, when you and I recognize, I have to give an account of myself. And I'll be honest with you, that disturbs me a little because I'm wondering how I'm going to tell him about certain things. And so I can't sit in judgment on you. I'm worried about Vernon McGee. Let us therefore not judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, Paul's going to develop that thought, that my conduct has to be for the sake of the weak brother. Now, If I'm with a fellow that believes he shouldn't travel on Sunday, and he and I are in a car together, he said, I just can't go today, McGee. I'm going to have to stay with him. I'll stay with him because 
Not that I agree with him, but for the sake of the weak brother. We need to recognize that. And what Paul is saying here, he says, Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let us not chop each other up. And my, there are certain churches today where they do a good job of chopping each other up. Now he goes on to say, verse 16, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. In other words, your Christian liberty today may cause you to be criticized. You need to be careful. For the kingdom of God, he says, is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And how this verse has been abused. This is actually the only reference in this epistle to the kingdom of God. And I personally do not believe it's synonymous to the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, which finds its final fruition in the millennial and messianic kingdom here on earth. Now, I think the kingdom of God embraces, actually, all that's in God's created universe. And in that, there is the church. And I think that he's having reference to that. And it's broader and larger, and it includes God's reign over all his creation. And I think that Dr. Lang has given us a good, satisfactory definition. He says, the heavenly sphere of life, in which God's Word and Spirit govern, and whose organ on earth is the church. Now, I think that was our Lord's use of the term. Remember, the Lord Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that's that heavenly sphere of life in which God's Word and Spirit governs. And of Dr. Stifler, as we said before, God rules everywhere, but there is a realm where he governs by spiritual forces or laws alone. And that is in the area of the life of the believer. Now, man is totally incapable of seeing or entering this kingdom without the new birth. Now, this kingdom has nothing in the world to do with eating or drinking, fasting, no meat on Friday, no pork or vegetarian diet. These things actually just don't enter into it, my beloved. Righteousness here, I think, would mean the same as it does in Romans. It means to be right with God. It means a life lived, well-pleasing to him. And in the Holy Spirit, it goes with righteousness, and it has reference to our standing, not only to our standing, but our walk. It's walking in the Spirit. It's practical rather than theological. It's moral rather than oral. It's a righteousness in the Holy Spirit rather than the righteousness in Christ. And this joy here is something that's absent today in the lives of believers. It's a fruit of the Spirit. There should be joy in our lives. That doesn't mean you've got to run around smiling like a Cheshire cat. And then we've got a group of song leaders today. I think they don't have anything else to say. And they get up and say, now everybody smile. Well, I learned a long time ago, I don't have to smile just because a song leader wants me to smile, and that doesn't prove whether I'm a Christian or not. I think it's whether you've got joy down in your heart. Now, he says here in verse 18, For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of man. Now, he's not trying to say that there's not going to be a literal kingdom on this earth. The Lord Jesus said, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine till I drink it with you in the kingdom. There will be a literal kingdom on this earth. But he's talking about this spiritual realm that you enter today by the new birth, you see. And these are the things for the one serving Christ. In this, he's well-pleasing to God, and he's approved of man. Now, it doesn't mean that men are going to get in the cheering section and applaud you and give 15 for you. Because you're a believer, they may even persecute you. But underneath, men do approve a genuine believer. And they despise and reject that which is hypocritical and phony today. This is a great principle of conduct. The walk and talk of the believer should please God and meet the approval of the conscience of man. Now, he says in verse 19, "...let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace." and things wherewith one may edify another. He intends to give the believer an exhortation here, and it's a twofold exhortation. To pursue peace here means to press toward the mark. The believer is to make a definite effort to avoid the use of food or any physical thing 
which offends a brother. This, by the way, is the negative aspect of the exhortation that he's been giving. We should press toward the mark of spiritual values, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. These are the things that build us up and do not destroy us, you see. It's impossible for a child of God to grow today. We're going to see apart from the Word of God. Now, verse 20 says, For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eateth with offense. On account of food, do not tear down the work of God. Now, the believer has the liberty to eat meat or abstain from it. Meat doesn't commend us to God. But for the sake of the physical, do not tear down the work of God in the heart of some weak believer. Don't do something that would absolutely wreck his own life. We need to recognize the old bromide is accurate. One man's porridge is another man's poison. And Esau, for instance, he had no regard for God and the birthright, and he was willing to exchange it for a bowl of soup. Don't sell your birthright just to satisfy your appetite. Now, verse 21, "...it's good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything, whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak." And he returns to this issue, eating and drinking. And I think probably in this we do offend some folk. Now, verse 22 gives us the second great principle of Christian conduct. Will you listen now very carefully? Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Now let me give you my translation. The faith which thou hast, have thou to thyself in the sight of God. Blessed or happy is the man that judgeth not himself in the thing which he approves. And that means that which he does. The very interesting thing is, he's now taking up, actually, the other aspect of Christian conduct. Now, he said, as you look toward doing something for God, you ask yourself the question, will it be right for me to do this? Can you do that? with excitement and anticipation and joy as you look toward it. Now, this exhortation looks back at what you've done. Happy is the man that doesn't condemn himself in that which he has done. Now, I want to use a ridiculous illustration, and I know it'll be misunderstood. I've been asked the question, can a Christian get drunk? And the answer is yes. The prodigal son was a son out in the far country. And I'm confident he did that and quite a few other things. But he was always a son. Now, what was the difference then between the prodigal son and those pigs? Well, the difference is simply this. There never was a pig that said, I will arise and go to my father. <laughs> that prodigal son down there in the pig says, I don't like it here. I hate it and I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to rise and go to my father, and I'm going to confess what a sinner I am and what I've done. Now, what's the difference then between the man that gets drunk, who's a Christian, and the man in the world who gets drunk? And what's the difference between the two then? Well, the difference is simply this, that that man in the world, the next morning, he'd get up with a headache, and he'll put an ice pack on it, but the next night he'll say, boy, I sure had a big time. I'm going to get me a bigger bucket of paint and a bigger paintbrush, and I'm really going to paint the town red next time. But what about the child of God? Happy is the man <laughs> that proves himself and what he's done. And that child of God, that next morning with a head as big as a barrel, he drops down by the side of his bed and he said, oh, God, I hate myself and I don't want to do that again. I'll arise, I'll go to my Father. And the Lord Jesus said, I'll have to wash your feet if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the interesting thing is, there's no record the prodigal son went back the next year to the pig pen. He didn't like it down there. That's the difference, my friend. That's the difference today. 
and happy as the man. Now, are you doing something, Christian, today that after you've done it, you look back and you hate yourself for it? Now, I don't care what that is. You're wrong. You're wrong. It could even be going to church. And I think sometimes that's the most dangerous place for some people. It was a dangerous place for Simon Peter to be in the upper room. So many say, oh, if I could only been in the upper room with Jesus, how wonderful it would have been. Had you ever stopped to think that the most dangerous place in Jerusalem that night was in the upper room? I heard of a preacher that went over there and came back. He thought that when they showed him the so-called upper room, he'd really seen it. Well, of course, what they show you, that was built in about the 10th, 11th century. It's Byzantine. It hasn't anything to do with our Lord's Day. I do not know that it was even in that particular area. It could or could not be. I'm of the opinion it was probably over in another section. But be that as it may, he said, oh, what a feeling he had. How wonderful it would have been to be in the upper room. Well, that's the worst place in Jerusalem to have been that night. You know why? Because we're told that Satan was there. I don't know whether he was down in the slum area or with the drunks at the bar room. I don't think he was. He already owns that crowd. Why fooleth them? He's more or less ashamed of them. So he moved in another area altogether. He was in the upper room. My friend, sometimes the most dangerous place to be in church, you see. So do you have to condemn yourself? Did you come home from church Sunday and say, oh, I wish I could have bit my tongue off. I wish I hadn't said what I said. Well, you shouldn't have said it. <laughs> May I say to you that happy is the man that doesn't condemn himself. Oh, to look back on your conduct and say, oh, I'm glad I did that. I'm happy I went over to see so-and-so. Now, let's move on here. Happy is the man that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allows. We're told here in verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith. May I say, my friend, you ought to believe in what you're doing. And if you don't believe in it, you ought not to be doing it. The believers saved by faith. The believers to walk by faith, you see. And that's the thing to test his conduct.